to episode 32 of Yarn to Table. I'm Celeste and this is a show about my knitting life. Um, today I have two finished objects to share with you. I have some exciting whips and in my chit chat, se chit -chat segment um, I'm going to talk about a book all about yarn that I've taken out of the library and that I love so much. Um, so let's get into it. While I'm thinking about it, I'll just let you know what tea I'm drinking because I didn't mention it. I think it was last week, the same tea. It's Spangle Spice by um, Celestial Seasonings and it's my absolute favorite spice type tea because it has a bunch of cardamom and other really great stuff in there adding different levels. It's got clove. Um, so it's, it's not just like major cinnamon up front and not a lot else going on. I feel like the cardamom makes it really, really delicious. So that's my favorite. Um, also, I'll just go ahead and say I'm probably going to touch my hair a lot today and I probably touch my hair a lot every day and um, I'm just going to give like a blanket apology for that because <laughs> I know it probably annoys some people. I am growing out my bangs and I'm also looking at myself on a video monitor. Um, and if you have either done either ever done either of those things, or definitely if you've done them at the same time, um, then you might be able to understand that like not fixing my hair is just not going to happen. Um, so sorry, I will probably be fixing my hair a lot. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, okay. Like I said, my name is Celeste. On social media, I'm Celeste Full. You can find me on Ravelry and Instagram. And I post updates on my knitting on Instagram and other fun stuff in my life, but I also keep my project pages up to date on Ravelry. So you can definitely go there if you have questions about needle size or alterations I made to a pattern or what yarn something was that you saw on the podcast. Um, also, there's a blog posts tab for every project that I've knit uh, that I've knit since I started the podcast in December and those are going to link you directly to all of the episodes of this podcast where I showed that project so if you're interested in going into some of the back catalog and um, checking that out um, that's how you can do it there's also a group on Ravelry, Yarn to Table. You can find that by searching for it in the Groups tab. You can also click a link directly in the doobly-doo here on YouTube. Um, and that's where you're going to find show notes for every episode. It's where you're going to find giveaways and knit-alongs. And there's also an Ask Me Anything thread where you can ask questions to have them answered on the podcast. And the Introduce Yourself thread uh, is... One of my favorite threads, if you are watching for the first time or one of the first times or you've just been looking, lurking for a while and um, you feel like introducing yourself, I would absolutely love if each and every one of you um, who watches the podcast and joins the group would post in there. You don't have to tell me much about yourself or you can tell me your whole life story. I would love it either way. Um, Ideas of things you can share are what you're knitting right now, your favorite things to knit, how you learned to knit, where you're from, um, what other podcasts you enjoy watching would be interesting. I watch a lot of podcasts, so I would love to know that. Um, what you like about this podcast, anything you'd like to see more of, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, I always like to ask people also what house they would be in at Hogwarts, so if you know that, um, or if you have a guess, let me know in there. Um, but I love, love, love hearing from you guys, um, returning subscribers and new viewers alike. So um, definitely consider doing that. You can also leave a comment here on YouTube if that's more your style. Um, and welcome. Okay, so let's talk FOs. I am wearing my first FO. Now, if you've only been watching for a couple episodes, you may not recognize this because I had um, been neglecting it-ish for a few weeks working on other stuff. Um, this is 
the Gorgeous Void, which is a pattern by Melanie Berg. And it is a very big worsted weight, um, what's this word I'm looking for? Crescent shaped shawl. And it's all done with this absolutely beautiful twisted stitch pattern. So this texture is made using twisted stitches, pearls, knits, and then this little, um, this wrapping technique here. And then it has a garter stitch ridge. So it has this sort of cable-ish appearance with the lattice, but there is not any actual cabling. No need to use a cable needle, no need to cable without a cable needle, um, if that's how you cable. So if you're interested in texture and you're kind of wanting to take it up a notch from some simple textures, but you are maybe not a huge fan of cables, I would absolutely recommend this. It is a really, really, really fun texture to knit. It took a little bit of concentration at first, but it became um, intuitive very quickly, memorizable very quickly, everything except the edge where you're increasing, and so there's some stuff a little bit different there. Before the main portion, I could just read my knitting, know what I was doing, um, and it was really, really, really enjoyable to knit. The yarn is lovely. This is Malabrigo in the Rio space, which is a worsted weight. Don't quote me on the fabric content, but I want to say it's 100% merino. It actually might have some nylon in there. But it's a worsted weight, um, beautifully dyed. This colorway is called Glitter. And it's picking up, I think, pretty well on the camera what it is. It's a nice brown with shades of copper, some pumpkin-y colors in there, um, some rust reds, and even a little bit of green and hazel in places. It is stunning. And this colorway is very outside my comfort zone, um, but I was just really drawn to it. So I bought this yarn while I was in Cambridge for my last uh, residency. If you don't know, I'm pursuing a master's in fine arts and um, twice a year I go to Cambridge, Massachusetts for a residency for that. And I went to a local yarn store. Um, I don't remember what it's called, but it'll be on the um, page for this yarn in my stash, the name of the store, if you're curious. Um, and I saw the Malabrigo and I was just absolutely smitten by this colorway, completely drawn to it. And I, I was like, that is what I'm going to wear in the fall. I knew immediately that I wanted to make a void out of it. Um, and I purchased four skeins. I ended up using about three and a half. I haven't actually weighed the final skein, but I would guess around, I used around half of it, maybe a little less. Um, and I, so like I said, this colorway is very much outside my comfort zone, what I usually would buy and wear, but it felt very fall and I was very into the depth of color in it. I mean, Malabrigo, just you can't go wrong, really. Um, and so I knew I wanted to knit this for fall, so I cast it on at the end of July because August starting really felt like pre-fall for me. Um, and then I was knitting on it, you know, fairly consistently. Some weeks I wouldn't get to it because I'd be knitting on other things. And last week, as I mentioned to you guys, it was starting to creep up on me that if I didn't, I was about halfway through it at that point, and if I didn't um, really dedicate myself to it, I was afraid that I wouldn't finish it in time to wear it during the fall. Um, so I have knit pretty monogamously on this all week. Like I said, I was only about halfway through, so I knit about half of this big old shawl, and if you can see, like, so the halfway point is about here, so this much. Now, I actually I knit in this direction, but I'm just giving you an idea of like how much um, knitting was done this week, I guess. But um, 
but yeah, but it starts here and it goes this direction. I hope that wasn't confusing. My point is that I did a lot on it this week. I got a lot accomplished. I actually finished this a few days ago um, and blocked it. And I've not had a chance to wear it outside yet because it's actually very warm here. But um, I have been enjoying wearing it indoors in the AC <laughs> a little bit. And so what's so crazy cool about this is, like I said, I wanted to get it finished for fall. And I ended up finishing it the night before the equinox, which I didn't realize until the next day that it was going to be the equinox. I just didn't remember. Um, and the next day, you know, I saw like the Google Doodle and I was like, oh my God, it's the first day of fall. And then I realized, wow, I finished my shawl to wear in fall the last day of summer. How perfect was that? Like really, really cool. So like I said, I absolutely love it. Um, one thing I would do differently if I knit it again, as you can see, this edge is slightly curved. And in the photos of the of the project on the pattern page, it's quite straight. Now, the pattern says that some people might find the edge to be too tight. And in order to loosen it, they recommend doing a yarn over before the last stitch near the edge and then um, dropping that yarn over on the next row. Now, when I was beginning knitting this, it was a new texture. I was like, I'm getting used to the texture and adding this extra thing that I would have to remember on my own because it wasn't in the chart. I was following the chart, not written directions. And because of that, I felt like, what if I forget to do it on some rows, not on others? And like, it just felt like a lot to add that. <laughs> and it kind of sounded optional in the pattern. It sounded like if you find that it's too tight, like this is something you might want to do. And I typically don't find that things are too tight because I'm kind of a lo looser knitter. Um, I knew my yarn that I was using was really strong. I wasn't worried about it snapping. So I just decided not to. And a little ways into the pattern, it became clear to me that it was going to be a little curved and not straight. Um, and at that point, the only way to really fix that would be either to start doing the yarn overs so that the rest of it would be straighter and then it would just be a little curved and then straight which is kind of you know like not the best because it's like wouldn't you rather just do make it consistent um you know on, on second thought i mean like i could have done that it wouldn't have been that big a deal for it to be a little curved here and then straight for the rest of it like, i think that would have been fine but um i just didn't and in blocking I definitely could have blocked it more curvy or less curvy, you know, because you have a little bit of control. Um, but there was absolutely no way that this was going to get blocked straight because there's just too much fabric down here. Um, if you wanted this part to go in a straight line, the fabric down here would literally just have to cross over itself like a ruffle or something. So it did end up being a little curved. Now, in practice, actually wearing it, I basically don't mind that almost at all because I mostly wear it um, in various ways wrapped around my neck and so the curve of it honestly just feels really natural uh, now of course I have these bits hanging down and they sort of curve a little bit and maybe it would be a bit nicer if they were straight um, so like I said if I were to knit another one I probably would do the yarn over I would probably recommend to you guys to do that but does it make me love this one any less? It really doesn't, um, not at all. And I was honestly pretty worried about it toward the end of my knitting. I was kind of worried that I had knit this whole thing in this beautiful yarn and I enjoyed knitting it and what if I didn't love it as much because it wasn't exactly like the pattern picture. Um, but that just hasn't been the case at all. I really love it, so that's good. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can wear this. Um, here I have it sort of layered around with this part on top and this part underneath, which I think is cute. But you can also do a thing where you sort of, like a traditional thing of putting the, both of the ends under it. And then because it's this big crescent shape, I've also found that there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with it over your shoulders and wearing it more like a wrap. 
um, which is kind of the way that I think a lot of like sophisticated older women will wear um, shawls, and I think a lot of younger women will do them kind of more like scarves like this. Um, and I really love it both ways. I love the variety, I love the options. I think I'd like to wear it like this if I were wearing it indoors and I was a little chilly or if I were wearing it on like a colder evening of a warmer day. I like the option of kind of being able to pull it around my shoulders, which is something that you can't really do with like a skinny scarf. But at the same time, if I have like a coat on or something and I really just want it all up around my neck, I can wear it that way as well. So um, yeah, I'm just, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. And I think it looks really nice with this um, green color, this olive green color, which is something I wear a lot because it's the color of my eyes. And like I said, there's little bits of almost a green color in the yarn. So that makes it look really nice. So yeah, I love it. It, it smells really, um, this yarn smells nice and sheepy. I think it's a little bit less processed than some of the um, some of the sock yarn and stuff that you know you get used to when you're you're working with it a lot. Not that this is super rustic; it's extremely soft and it's definitely a worsted spun. Um, and I honestly should look up what the freaking content is if I'm going to try to talk about the yarn. Let me do that. <laughs> but um, what I'm trying to say is. For how processed it feels, for how like soft and uniform and like it's not rustic, um, it smelled quite sheepy, which I really, really appreciated as like while you're working with it, I just love that smell and actually when I blocked it I didn't put in any wool wash or anything because I wanted to preserve as much of the sheepy smell as I could and it's not as sheepy as it was before it went in the water but it's still quite good so I appreciate that. So let's see here, Rios is 100% merino wool. I was right. I was right the whole time. And it does not say superwash. Um, nope, it does say superwash. Yes, so it is 100% superwash merino wool. So I think that would explain why it's got a little bit of that slickness to it, like I was saying, not rustic. Um, but I thought it smelled quite sheepy for a superwash yarn. Um, so, yeah. There is that. The other finished object I have to share with you guys is something that um, you haven't seen me start. And I almost kind of wanted to not finish it before the podcast because I liked the idea of showing it to you as a work in progress because the construction is a little interesting. But um, so yesterday I was going to cast on something else instead of finishing this project. And to cast on the other thing, I would have needed my USA 6 or 4 millimeter needles, and they were in this project, and I could have just unscrewed them. Um, but I really wanted to work on it, to be honest, so that was kind of the excuse I needed. So I just went ahead and finished it. It's a hat. It is the Lolo hat. And this is by Jared Flood, who you will know as the founder, I believe, of Brooklyn Tweed. Um, certainly like the creative director, I guess. I think he's the founder anyway. <sighs> Talk about sheepy. Just getting it within a few inches of my nose. Mm. Oh my gosh, like I could just... I just, is anyone else obsessed with the smell of lanolin? I've loved it since I was a kid and I toured a sheep farm. I've always thought, why do we not have lanolin scented candles and like hand cream and everything? Like why is everyone not in love with this? Anyway, this is by Jared Flood. I also knitted it out of Brooklyn Tweed Yarn Shelter, which is their uh, worsted base and I will say is my favorite yarn that I've ever worked with. Um, so the, this is left over in the sweatshirt colorway from my Kodo sweater, which was the first sweater I made for myself, um, which I made last year. 
and I had I bought too much sort of intentionally and then I ended up using a lot and then I went and I bought some more <laughs> and anyway in the end I had like about one and a half skeins now this hat calls for only one skein but I ended up needing to break into um, so I started with the full skein that I had but I ended up needing to break into the little half skein um, and I believe that is because my gauge was still a little large so it called for a US size 7 I sized down to a 6 um, I didn't gauge swatch, but I have knit this exact yarn on US6 before for my Kodo. And the Kodo, also called for a seven, was written by the same pattern company for the same yarn. I was using the same yarn and had the same gauge expected. Um, so I kind of felt like I could just go ahead and use the six <laughs> since I had basically done everything before. Um, but, so this is knit, if you don't know, sort of this direction. So the back seam is actually your cast on edge, and then you go around, which is unusual for a hat, right? And so because of that, um, my row gauge actually seems fine, but I believe my stitch gauge, which in this case is up and down for the hat, usually that would be a row gauge, but because the pattern, my stitch gauge is up and down for the hat. You can see here the garters, ridges going across and the V's of the knit stitches, right? So my stitch gauge must have been a tiny bit large because when I wear this, I still like it and everything, it's cute, but when I wear this, um, it comes down just a little bit longer than in the photo. And that coupled with the fact that I used more than one skein makes me feel like that's the situation. Um, now I don't know if I could have solved for that by using a five or what, um, but I still feel like I made the most intelligent decision that I could at the time without knitting a gauge swatch. and. Uh, knitting a gauge swatch for a hat is just like, I'm just, I'm not doing it. So, whatever. Um, obviously, if you're knitting a hat this direction, you know, you can just, and you want it to be a little shorter, you can just stop sooner. But because it was knit around the head, um, there was really, I would hold it up to my head and it did feel like it might be a little long, but there was really no way to confirm that until I got to the point where I was looking like I was going to run out of yarn. And at that point I was going, yeah, my gauge swatch was probably off. Whatever. It's not really a big deal. Hat still looks cute. I had enough yarn, so I didn't actually run out, even though I used more than one skein because I had more than one skein. Um, and honestly, this was one of the most fun things I've ever knit. This was also so incredibly fun. So you cast on back here and you actually use a provisional cast on because you seam it up with a, uh, a three needle bind off on the inside, which is cool. And then, you know, you go around and you have these increases and decreases to create these sort of ear flap type things. They're not exactly ear flaps. It's more like just a subtle ear shape. I think it looks kind of like a helmet. Um, so you use increases and decreases for that while at the same time shaping the crown with short rows. And this here, these may look like seams, but they actually are not. They are where I, um, what would be the word for when you've done short rows and then you go across all of them, resolve. Those are where I have resolved my short rows. So these are actually not seams at all. Um, so as you're going along, you're doing increase and decrease while also doing short row shaping. And it's taking care of the shape of the top and the shape of the bottom for you. There's three charts. There's one for this part, one for the center, and one for the edge. 
really the whole thing could have been all one chart, but it was just like a matter of fitting it on different pages. And I think he realized it would be sort of simpler for people if they could just think about it in three parts. Um, and then when you've done all of that, three needle bind off, you then have a tiny hole at the top. Like I said, these don't need to be seamed. They're already resolved, but you do have a tiny hole at the top. So then you cast on and just do a little bit to close that up. And uh, that's the whole thing. And it was super, super enjoyable. It was obviously a little more complicated than an ordinary hat. And so it took a little bit longer, a little more concentration. Most hats, you're not going to be doing increasing while also doing short row shaping on another part of it. Like that's kind of a slightly complicated construction. Um, so I, you know, it's not, it's not going to be like your mindless little just simple ribbed hat. But that's really what I was looking for. I was looking for something that was fun and interesting to knit. I also really like the way it looks. I chose it for that reason as well. So this is the perfect combination of a process and product project. Um, and obviously I love the yarn. So that worked out great. And um, what else? Oh, the entire pattern is done in charts. There are no row directions. I don't know why, because I know a lot of people prefer rows and are kind of freaked out by charts. And I almost wonder <laughs> if it was sort of their way of saying, if you're freaked out by charts, you really probably shouldn't do this project because it might be a little too complicated for you. Um, which, I mean, I kind of would agree with, but also at the same time, some people's minds just work differently and some people just like row instructions. Um, now, I think that to a certain extent, when you follow row instructions for something like this, you're doing yourself a disservice because when you're following the chart, you're getting a larger picture idea of why you're doing what you're doing and you're not sort of like just walking through it with blinders on. Um, this actually became incredibly intuitive very quickly. Um, at first, I was like, wow, there's a lot going on. This is a really difficult pattern. And then... You know, I'm knitting along. Maybe by the time I got here, I was like, oh, I get this. Like, at first, I could only knit on it while I was doing something like watching a podcast, something that was a bit like slower paced, and I'm not going to like lose track of the plot or miss some event, you know? And then I was able to work on it while watching um, Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> so I feel like if you can work on something while watching Handmaid's Tale, it's pretty intuitive. Um, so I would say helpful prereqs for this would be chart reading and reading your knitting well, but, um, I'm not going to discourage you if, you know, you, um, haven't done a chart before and you want to learn how to do a chart for this pattern. I think you can totally do that. Totally. I think this would be a good pattern to do that for. Go. Like, get it. Um... All, but I would also say, kind of important to be able to read your knitting if you don't want to get super frustrated. However, learning how to read your knitting, I mean, that's also something that you learn from doing. And I think this is one of those patterns where as you're making it, it starts to make sense what you're doing and why. And this could be a good pattern for, you know, kind of making those connections. So if you're at a point where you you can kind of read your knitting, but you know, you've still got some questions. Um, really understanding the construction of this and working from that chart, I think could be a really good learning experience. And it's a small piece um, with a lot of the same stuff going on all the way around it and worsted weight yarn. So if you got to rip back, you know, it's easy to redo and like, I think if those are things you're interested in learning about, I would recommend this. Um, yeah, and and it's cute. Like I said, so I like it. Definitely not a slouchy hat. A lot of people only wear those slouchy hats, but um, it's crazy warm. I mean, it's got the fact that it comes way down and covers up your ears helps it to be super warm. And also, I apologize for <laughs> for messing with my hair, but then I, it's also the episode where I, for some reason, put a hat on and take it off several times. Anyway, also warm because it's Brooklyn Tweet Shelter. 
And Brooklyn Tweed Shelter is not only 100% non-super washable, but it is also um, woolen spun instead of worsted spun. And that makes it even warmer while still being really light and fluffy and luscious. Yeah, so it's great. It's super great. Favorite yarn ever, for sure. I want to do another sweater out of Brooklyn Tweed Shelter this winter. Like, it's, it's, I'm pretty much certain it's happening at this point. Working with it again on this hat just made me remember how much I love it. And I think that stonecutter is going to happen. It's almost a shame that I wanted to do the stonecutter in cast iron because that colorway is almost black. It's like a really dark gray. And um, even with this, this color, the flex and the tweediness in it, there's whites and blacks in there, which is nice. But some of the other colors have colored flex and they can be really interesting to work with. Um, and I've worked with them before. I've done homemade jam and I've done meteorite, I think, which is like a dark brown. But um, I want to I wanna do a whole sweater out of some of those color colors as well, but I don't think that's what I want the stone cutter to be. I really think I want the stone cutter to be just like dark and dramatic and amazing. So we'll see. Maybe I'll have to do two Brooklyn Tweed sweaters this winter. I don't know. Anything could happen. All I want to do is knit sweaters out of Brooklyn Tweed for the rest of my life. Okay. So those are my FOs. Um, now let's get into some whips. And I'm. I don't want to take this off because it's so pretty, but I think I need to. I'm getting a little warm. A little bit toasty. Okay. Let me zhuzh. Zhuzh, zhuzh, zhuzh. Zhuzh, zhuzh, zhuzh. Mm -hmm. It's basically at that point where I can almost like tuck it behind my ear and it stays, which is so exciting. Man, growing up bangs. Ugh. It's rough. Okay, so um, I have a swatch for something that I've not yet cast on, but I'm probably going to cast it on today. I was going to cast it on, as I said, yesterday, but I finished the hat instead. But I do have a swatch. And right now, if you're not thinking to yourself, hot damn, what is that? That's the most beautiful yarn I've ever seen in my life. Then honestly, I question your sanity because this is spectacularly beautiful. This is Stranded Dye Works by the incredibly talented Amy Florence, hand-dyed. This is her Paradise Base, which is an MCN, fingering white, four-ply, four-ply. Yep. Um, and the colorway is called Shiner. So it's this incredibly beautiful, I, I hesitate to even call it a semi-solid because I feel like there are areas of gray and areas of lavender. And to me, those are different colors, but they blend so effortlessly that they almost do give the appearance of a semi-solid. Um, I guess what I would say is it's a semi-solid, but I would not call it a tonal. A tonal, I feel, is colors that are the same shade and they're just varying in intensity. So you have like light reds all the way into dark reds. Um, this, I would say, truly has lavender and gray, which are not the same shade. So I would call this a semi-solid. I think I feel comfortable with semi-solid. But anyway, gray is my favorite color, and lavender is another favorite, and I love the way that lavenders can look gray and grays can look lavender. I love that. Um, I learned once that your shadow is actually not uh, gray, it's actually lavender. It's a purple color because sunlight is not white light exactly. It's more of a yellow and therefore the shadows that it casts are more of a purple. 
Um, so it's very subtle, but you can notice it sometimes. Um, and I think there's something so insanely beautiful about the fact that our shadows are purple. Um, so yeah, like a lot of times storm clouds can be purple and stones and all kinds of things that look gray at first are actually kind of purple underneath. And I feel like that's very much what this makes me think of. So that's a beautiful color story for me. I also assume the name comes from um, a shiner meaning a black eye, which I think is kind of a cheeky, funny little thing to name this because that's also that blue, purplish black color, grays, is um, also the color of a bruise, like a black eye. <laughs> so it's just interesting all the weird places in nature that we find these color inspirations from. Um, so anyway, I knit up the swatch. I sized down from whatever they were asking for. What would it have been? Yeah, they asked for a seven and I sized down to a six, which on fingering weight yarn is quite a loose gauge. Um, I find that a lot of sweaters for fingering weight will ask you for a four, um, and this one was asking for a seven. So that's quite a big difference. But as you can see, it really looks quite nice. I don't think it's too loose of a gauge at all. I actually really like the fabric. I kept holding it on my arm and imagining that that was my sweater and I felt like I really liked I liked what it was doing. Uh, it's not going to be like super stretched out in places, you know. It's it's going to it's going to be well fitted. So I think it's going to be nice. I don't think I mentioned the um, actual pattern that I'm going to be making. It's called Pavement. And it's by Vera Velamaki, and it is a pullover, very subtle, beautifully designed pullover with like three-quarter length sleeves and a sort of um, split uh, hem thing and just some nice accents of garter stitch on it with a lot of stockinette. Um, I think it's just going to look stunning in this. The pictures for the pattern are actually in kind of a almost like a more dramatic version of this colorway. It's kind of a lavender gray with a lot of darker places and some black places in it. Um, more of a variegated and less of a semi-solid, but a very kind of similar color story. Um, and that looks gorgeous, and I think it's going to look gorgeous in this. I got this yarn at House of Yarns, which is a, a local yarn store in Nashville when we were down there for the eclipse. And um, I don't believe that she regularly stocks uh, stranded, I could be wrong. Absolutely don't quote me on it. I don't want to misrepresent her, but my assumption, and you know what they say about assumptions, so full disclosure, but my assumption is that she had this leftover from SSK, which I know Amy went to this summer. I think that was in July and we were there in August, so um, I don't believe it's always there, but I could definitely be wrong. And there could definitely still be some there now, because it's September, so for what it's worth. But, even if she doesn't, you should still go to that yarn store, because it was honestly the best yarn store I've ever been to in my life. So, House of Yarns, Nashville, Tennessee. Anywho, excited about this. That'll make um, two sweaters on my needles, which is a nice comfortable number for me. I don't like to have an insane number of whips going. Um, I feel like four to six with at least one of those being socks. Um, six sometimes starts to feel like a lot, but uh, I'm super into sweaters right now and I feel like sweaters should be um, occupying a large portion of my, of my whip. So I feel like sort of the comfortable place that I'd like to be is like two sweaters, a pair of socks, and then maybe something else that's rotating in and out that can be smaller, like you're doing some kind of hat or something, or a shawl. Um, I feel like that's kind of the sweet spot. Blankets don't count. I have those on the go all the time. Okay, so my last whip is my socks. Now, I did record Return to Stars Hollow this week, but I didn't work on the Pop-Tarts and Happy, Pop-Tarts and Coffee socks. 
Um, and that is because I had just got to the point on my candy apple socks where I needed to start my heel and I wanted to do a two color heel and I didn't know how I was going to do that and it was going to be an experiment and just not a good on the go project. So I needed that to be um, something that I did before it went back to being my on the go project and I was really excited about it. So I just did it during that recording. So that's why I haven't worked on the pop touch and hap happy. Why do I keep saying happy? <laughs> Apparently in my vocabulary, coffee and happy are the same word, which honestly makes a lot of sense now that I put it that way. Okay, so that's why I haven't worked on those. I have been working on these, and I'm excited to show you what's going on with them. Of course, my yarn is giving me some issues. Hang on here. Boop. Meh. Oh my god, I just managed to literally tie a knot around. <laughs> I was gonna cut all this out, but now it's become entertaining. Okay, I did it! Okay. <laughs> These are a socks made from a sock set by Nora George Yarns called Candy Apple. It comes with 100 grams of this spectacularly beautiful speckly goodness and 20 grams of this lovely contrast. And I'm making vanilla socks with a twist. Um, so, as I showed you before, I did the cuff out of the contrast and then I did some stranded leading into the main color. This is all inspired by some fun stuff I saw in a sock by Pow of Pow Knits. Now I've done a little two color heel and I'm going to do the toe with something similar to this, some stranded leading into a green toe. So here's my fun little two color heel. And it's, it's very subtle because the green solid is a color that shows up in speckle form within the speckled yarn. So I really like that look, but I also think this same heel would look really nice with contrasting yarns like black and white. And then my heel turn I just did in the solid green. Um, so the way I did this two color heel, I did a, a basic slip stitch heel. And what I essentially did was I would, um, knit across, no, I would I would always start, okay, so I would start on the wrong side and I would slip, purl, slip, purl, slip, purl, and then knit back. And then I would change yarns and slip, purl, slip, purl, slip, purl, knit back. Change yarns, slip, purl, slip, purl, slip, purl, knit back. So what ended up happening was every knit row just alternates colors and every purl row pulls the old color up in the slip stitches while adding a new color in the other stitches. So it creates sort of an interesting two color effect, which like I said, here just sort of gives you the sense of like a subtle watercolor blending of the two, which is also sort of what you get with the stranded here. It just sort of blends and that's kind of what's going on here. Um, so I really like that, but I do think it could also offer a different and interesting look with more contrasting colors. So that's where I'm at with this. Um, I have my little candy apple progress keeper that's giving me life. And like I said, this yarn is so spectacular it makes me happy every time I work with it. I can't stop looking at it. I want to eat it. I freaking love it. So, very, very into these socks. I think they are gorgeous. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say. The Stranded. <laughs> now that serves me right for tooting my own horn a little bit about how my, my Stranded gauge and my stockinette gauge matched. And how excited I am about that. 
that doesn't mean stranded is as stretchy as stockinette. Now I, at first, started to put this on my foot and I could not get it over my heel. And I went, oh no. <laughs> And I started thinking, okay, well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna finish the socks anyway, and they'll just be for a display. I can hang them on my wall. They're so beautiful anyway. <sighs> but doesn't that kind of feel like a cop out? I mean, doesn't that kind of feel like a failure? I still might do that. I might still just display them because they are so spectacularly beautiful. But it feels a bit like a cop out. So I really wanted it to work. So I did have you know, these sort of loose ends and I kind of loosen the floats and pull them a lot and tried to get the floats looser and I was able to get it over my heel. It's still a little tight, it's not super comfortable. Um, getting it over the heel, it's fine once it's on the leg. Um, but I guess the floats just need to be really loose if you want your stranded to stretch. Um, and I also think just generally, I mean, it kind of confuses me about what stranded socks are ever like because I like my socks to have some stretch to them, but with stranded, you typically want it to just fit well and you don't expect it to stretch much. Um, so that's kind of different. And um, I should probably do some more reading about stranded socks before I attempt to do like an entire color work sock, which is something I might do in the future. Not that I'm necessarily itching to right now. Anyway, my point is that I was able to stretch it enough to where it does get on my foot. Um, but just the fact that it got me thinking about possibly just having these as a display made me feel like I might actually want to do that, which is really silly and it kind of goes against my general attitude about knitting, which is like, you should wear beautiful things, you should use them. And it's not that I don't want to wear them or use them up or let them get worn out. It's almost more just that I want to showcase them. But I mean, I'm going to take a beautiful photo of them and that not that enough of a showcase? I don't know. I'll probably wear them. I'll probably wear them. But when I knit my second one, and when I knit the toe of this one, I am going to be trying to make as loose floats as possible, much more loose than I typically would, um, which might be a bit of a challenge because I like really nice clean floats and making really loopy loose ones I just don't really know how to do that, but that's what I'm going to try to do. <laughs> so yeah, so that's the drawback, um, but I had a lot of fun making up the two color heel and, uh, and I'm having a lot of fun with this insanely beautiful yarn. So other whips that I haven't touched this week, but you'll probably be seeing next week are um, my Ebba, which is a color work sweater. Though I haven't gotten to the color work part yet because it's bottom up. Um, and my Marled Magic shawl, which I just have one section and the bind off left. So I could definitely see finishing that this week. It all depends on where I end up wanting to put my energy. Either I'm going to get super monogamous with one of the sweaters and get a big portion of that done, which will feel nice. Um, or I'm going to do more of a mix of things. Um, I could also see myself whipping out another hat this week uh, just because I've been having some fun with hats lately. It's getting cold and I do still have a couple more hat plans that I discussed earlier um, in a, on the horizon. But they're for Stephen West's Garter Brio hat and um, for Andrea Mallory's um, uh, Vintage Prim hat. So. Who knows? I don't have anything to share with you for stash enhancement, but my chit chat is almost kind of a stash enhancement. I mean, like, 
Stash Enhancement as far as a new book, although I got it from the library, although I'm probably going to buy it now because I'm in love with it. So let me show this to you. This is called The Knitter's Book of Yarn, and it's by Clara Parks, and it's got a bunch of info on all different, you know, different fibers, everything you want to know about them, and then different things about how the yarn is spun and everything you want to know about that, all these different things about how the yarn is plied and everything you want to know about that, and then it kind of gets into giving you some patterns um, based on like what kind of thing would be ideal to make with uh, this yarn. I don't see myself necessarily using any of these patterns. Um, I mean, I could use some of them, I don't know, but none of the patterns particularly strike me as my thing, but I like the idea of sort of reading a pattern in the context of here's a pattern that was designed for this yarn. This is the kind of thing you want to do with this yarn, or this is the kind of yarn you want to do for this kind of pattern. Obviously, that's very good information. Um, and so that takes up a big portion of the book as well. So I haven't read this whole thing. What I have done is I've got buried a little bit in the index where it gives you, um, turn, uh, sorry, trying to like, I don't know how librarians do this at story time. Ah, oh, here we go. So like getting embroiled in this index where you can see it has all these terms for like fibers and like things like um, reading about the difference between, for example, a lot of podcasts lately, and I mentioned it earlier, talk about the difference between worsted and woolen spun yarn, um, all that kind of cool stuff. So I got really lost in that. I also, before I even started the book, got really lost in this beautiful image on the inside jacket where it shows all these different sources of fiber. This is really cool. See over here, it says um, these are uh, the cellulosic. So those are like the new wood pulp fibers that are sort of between um, people struggle with calling them synthetics or natural, like things like tencel. Um, and rayon and then you can see like the synthetics here it has the um, cellulose and it splits them up between cotton which is from the seed head and things like linen um, and hemp which come from the stalks and how that's an interesting distinction and then obviously all your protein fibers um, so that's like an insanely cool illustration um, and part of it is hidden by this thing that's glued down because it's a library book, but then you go to the other side and you have the same illustrations so I could see the rest of it. So that was nice. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you guys a little bit from here talking about wool generally to give you an idea of just how awesome, how awesome this book is. Um, so this is just from the very earliest introduction to the book. So she does the introduction and then she says, okay, now we're going to talk about the different fibers and she breaks them up by protein, cellulose, cellulosic, and, um, synthetic. And then she's going to take you through all of those. So I haven't read all of this yet. I, um, actually just started looking at it today because I just got it out of the library and I fell so in love with it that I almost didn't record the podcast because I just wanted to sit there reading it. Um, but then I thought, I want to share it with you guys. So I can't give you like a complete overall review. I can just tell you how great just dipping your toe into it is. But um, when she opens up this chapter on wool, she starts by talking about the scales. So all of the protein fibers um, are you know, just like your natural hair, if you look at it under a micro a microscope, um, it grows in these shingle shapes. And that's a big thing that contributes to how soft something is, is if it has more of those per inch, because, you know, like they're smaller and you're less likely to feel them. That in addition to the micron count, which is actually about how large um, the diameter of the fiber itself is and in addition to other things as well. But um, the 
she, you know, kind of talks about this, these, uh, like, for example, Angora apparently has, like, these chevron-shaped scales, so even though they're a lot larger, they feel soft, so I thought that was interesting, like, it's, it, it can get kind of complicated. So then, she starts to go in and talk about each fiber in depth, and I've read the one on wool, um, but then after wool, she's going to talk, um, and here she talks about, like, fineness, length, crimp, different things um then she gets into angora goats mohair and then pages and pages and pages on that right cashmere goat cashmere page a couple pages of that um angora which if you don't know is the rabbit uh, mohair is referring to angora goats alpaca llama muskox yak opossum and then silk which she says is sort of well, these are my words. I would say it's the, the duckbill platypus of fiber. <laughs> what she says is that it's hard to, quanti to qualify or put it into a category because it's an animal fiber, but it comes from a liquid that they extract instead of um, a hair. And it's a liquid that they extract after eating a plant. So it kind of has similarities actually to things like um, the, the cellulosic fibers, things like rayon. And also, it doesn't have that shingle shape, and that's a big part of why it's so insanely slippery compared to um, any other animal fiber. So, just to give you an idea of the voice of this and just the kind of like fascinating information you end up getting, let me read you a tiny bit of what she says about sheep wool. Wool and yarn is like restaurants in San Francisco. You could knit a different blend every day for a year without using the same yarn twice. It's as varied as the sheep on which it grows, running the gambit from rugged and rope-like to delicate and ethereal, with just about everything in between. Even within the same sheep breed, you'll find subtle differences from animal to animal, farm to farm. The first thing to know about wool is that it is hygroscopic. A great trait for clothing and an equally great word for your next crossword puzzle or cocktail party. Hygroscopic means that the fiber is able to absorb up to 30% of its weight in moisture while still feeling warm and dry against your skin. This helps the fabric breathe readily absorbing and releasing moisture to maintain a steady ecosystem of comfort against your skin, no matter how cold or damp the external weather may be. And also no matter how much you sweat. When my mother walked um, the El Camino in Spain, everyone said, wear wool, wear wool, because you can't wash your clothes as frequently. You know, it's essentially like a long hike like the Appalachian Trail except that they weren't camping, they were sleeping in hostels. Um, and everyone was like, a wool is the secret because you sweat and you get grimy and the different temperatures and like, wear wool, you'll be fine. And even though I've been yelling about wool to her for 20 years, she now is like, oh, wool's amazing. So, <laughs> continuing. <laughs> wool is naturally flame retardant. I knew that you weren't supposed to put babies in synthetic fibers, but I didn't know wool was flame retardant. And has long been a favorite material for firemen's blankets and industrial fabrics in public buildings. When exposed to flame, wool simply extinguishes itself without a peep. The constant level of moisture in the fiber keeps wool from conducting static electricity, which not only causes those annoying shocks, but also acts as a magnet to pull finder and dust particles deep into your garment. So that's what my mom's friends were getting at. Wool does not get dirty as quickly and easily as other. So it's flame retardant, breathes warm, resists dirt. Are you kidding me? Wool is also extremely resilient and highly extensible, which essentially means you can stretch it a third of its length or two thirds when wet, and it'll recover to its original shape. Despite over a century of effort, not a single man-made fiber yet possesses all these amazing qualities. Mm. 
I mean, don't you just feel like we just had a spiritual reading from the Book of Wool? <laughs> don't you just love it? Don't you just love wool? Uh, so I am just absolutely in love with this book right now and I want to devour it um, but I also think I'm probably going to need one to put on my shelf so we'll see maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that um, it looks like we are at that time again ladies and gents where it's time to say goodbye and um, listen I just want to thank you so much for tuning in today and for watching sticking along through the whole thing um, if you do enjoy my episodes, as I always mention, hitting the thumbs up button on YouTube helps other people find them. Um, so I really appreciate that a lot. If you haven't subscribed yet, definitely subscribe. Again, um, even if you don't use the subscription section on YouTube to keep track of what you're going to watch, just subscribing alone does help other people find my videos because it bumps me up in the algorithms. But also if you're not using the subscribe feature, that's a really great easy feature to use. That's what I use to um, kind of have like a watch list of um, all the podcasts that I want to watch. Um, and we will be doing some fun stuff in the near future, uh, which I will talk about, gosh, I guess, yeah, I guess I'll talk about next next week, although I probably should have announced this up front because next week will be the will be the first of October. Um, I'm gonna do some kind of vlogtober. I think that I would like to do videos every day. I don't want to overwhelm you guys with that. Um, so we'll see. It it's that's a lot. Um, it might be better for me to vlog every day and compile them into weekly vlog videos. Uh, so let me know if you would prefer daily or something else. Um, but I would like to do Vlogtober and I also have some plans to do some kind of Vlogtober exclusive giveaways. I have been cleaning out my stash a little bit and there is some beautiful yarn that is looking for a new home. And I think it could be really, really fun if we did some giveaways that were just for Vlogtober, um, Vlogtober watchers. So, that's a thing. Um, I've also been toying around with with new cows, because um, as you know, the last one ended. And uh, and I, I have some ideas. Um, so stay tuned. We're getting into the holidays. We're getting into cold weather. There's going to be lots of great nitty stuff going on on this channel. Um, and I love you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for all of your support. Just means so much to me. And I love chatting with you guys every week. So, um, yeah. Let me know what you think about Vlogtober. And I will see you in October.